It is a pleasure to introduce our speaker for today. Her name is actually pronounced Alba, spelled differently as you see, can, can see. Even I have been calling her Albi for the several years that I have known her. She's never corrected me. Alba and I met actually through another part of activism, which is feminist publishing. We met first at the International uh, Feminist Book Fair in Barcelona several, several years ago, when she uh, she's a co-founder of the Attic Press, which is a feminist uh, press in uh, Dublin. I was uh, representing Asher Publications. We met again in Amsterdam, in Melbourne, also with the International Feminist Book Fair, and have been bemoaning the fact that the a very vibrant and dynamic international conference and a trade fair that used to come together has, exact, has actually stopped because a lot of the feminist presses have been taken over by conglomerates. And the women's press, the Rago, Attic Press itself have been taken over by larger monopoly presses, Murdoch being one of them. Um, last year, I was in Dublin um, to give a talk at Dublin University, and Alva came to that. She saw how exa exhausted and worn out I was feeling. That was just after our last course, uh, which had been, in fact, our first, and immediately offered to come to, on her own funds to help out with the next course, and here she is. Alva is a feminist activist, and she wanted to make a point very clear that her first and primary identity lies in that. She's also the director of <clears throat> uh, the Women's Education Research and Resource Center at University College Dublin, and coordinates the graduate, undergraduate, and non-graduate programs in women's studies. She is the co-editor of the Women's Studies International Forum, a board member of the Irish Journal of Feminist Studies, and the author of Wildish Things, an anthology of contemporary Irish women writings, also the abortion paper Ireland, and the Irish Women's Studies Reader. Currently, she is working on health needs of women, working in prostitution, women's community-based education, empowerment, and feminist publishing. She is also a poet, and we hope that during uh, the course of her presentation, she might share some of her poetry with us. Thank you very much. Oh, good afternoon, everybody. And I have to say, I think this is the first time I've given a talk in such a lovely garden with the birds as musical accompaniment. And every morning I wake up, I sleep just over there, and I hear the birds, and I think how really quite remarkable they are in Pakistan and I know that I want to come back and not just for the music of the birds. Uh, the title of my uh, very loose paper this afternoon is Making for the Future, Challenges for Feminists. And I say it's rather loose, I think it's more a rumination than an argument. It's questions rather than answers. And not least because in the few days since I've been in Pakistan, I came on Saturday morning, I've been learning in a very immediate way about the need for me to reframe the challenges that I thought I had clear in my mind to do this seminar when I set out to come here. I seem to have more questions, more issues, more dilemmas, and there simply is not going to be time enough to go through them all. But equally, I feel that at the moment, it's going to take some time for many of the new things that I've learned and I'm still learning to really settle. And as somebody from the class said just a moment ago to me when we were chatting, it takes a while to absorb things, and indeed it does. But I really am extremely appreciative of the opportunity that I have of being here in the Institute. And I really want to thank Nikat very much indeed for asking me to come over and to come over and do a module on what I think is really a very central topic for all those of us who are feminist activists, who are and have been for a long time active in the women's movement and who are trying 
through education, through the development of women's studies, teaching and research to introduce new, younger generations of women to some of the principles and particularly the practices and the politics that we have grown up with and that we are also so significantly, I think, um, our generation of women throughout the world really responsible for good and for ill, for inventing, creating, putting in place. And I think uh, I really value the trust that Nikat had in me uh, to come over and teach with her, teach myself on this very important uh, module. I also very particularly want to thank my students um, for opening up and for asking questions and for telling me that they now have more questions in their minds than they did the other day. And that's a very valuable thing for me to know and it's exactly as it should be. I said to them just before we started, if you aren't upset by what you do in this whole wonderful women's studies course that's organized by the Institute. If you're not upset, if you're not deeply challenged, and that's really the immediate challenge that we're dealing with every day. If you're not challenged by what you're learning and by what you're doing, you might as well go home because that education is not going to be worth the time and the effort. Education which is not challenging, which is not disturbing, which is not in many ways disruptive, education which doesn't ask you to ask questions of yourself can hardly be worth the paper that it's going to be written on. And I feel that very strongly and I felt it for a very long time as an activist who is active not only but very significantly through the kind of teaching that I'm involved in. I do indeed, as Nikat says, describe myself as a feminist radical activist since the 1970s in Ireland, in Europe, and occasionally, uh, as somewhat to my shame, uh, I hear myself flitting around the world to Barcelona and Amsterdam and Melbourne. This does not happen every year. We should say that the Feminist Book Fair occurred every two years. So these were very rare opportunities that we got to do that all important thing, networking, because we're not going to have global feminism unless feminists can meet across nations across countries can meet globally to form the alliances, to make the coalitions, to do the networking that are so absolutely basic to the work that we're all differently engaged in. I do call myself a feminist radical activist, but among other identities. Uh, these identities are sometimes, I would have to say, somewhat less fluid than uh, postmodernists would have us believe, but sometimes they do shift and indeed in my own case, and I'm not going to go into detail now, they have shifted over the years. And I've sometimes found that very personally disturbing, but also ultimately, I hope, healthy and constructive and enriching. But what does that phrase, if you like, a feminist radical activist mean now in the late 1990s? I don't think I'm really going to answer that question. But what I do want to say is that how it is read, how it's understood, how it's received, how it's interpreted by others, what kinds of political possibilities that notion of being a radical feminist activist or doing radical feminist activism because it is an activity, what kinds of possibilities it opens or forecloses for us in the late 1990s is a huge challenge for me personally. And I think that leads me to my first point in this, this rumination or meditation on the notion of challenge as a feminist. For me, the challenges are not out there primarily. They have to start with me. They have to start with my sense of feminist purpose, my sense of feminist politics and practice, and how that is constantly not reforming and reshaping itself, because it's not some kind of entity out there, but how it is constantly being reformed, reshaped, redefined by the challenges I meet in my everyday life, in my own country, uh, and when uh, I'm fortunate, fortunate enough to travel. Talking, I want to be talking therefore with you today about challenge in the personal and the particular, as well as in the broader span, the more general. Every day, I find myself 
as I've been saying, personally challenged and confronting realities, experiences and politics that I haven't known about before are the implications of which I was unaware of. And having, and, and also my own feelings about this. Sometimes my feelings are deeply upset. My beliefs, my practices are, I, I feel quite emotional about this at times. Because after all, if you go back to the 1970s and you look at me now, you can do a quick bit of arithmetic and you can probably realize that really what I'm considering half of my adult life, because I'm going to live until I'm 100, I'm fully determined to do this. <laughs> this is going to be another challenge, by the way, because I smoke. But <laughs> half of my adult life has been lived really within whatever that means, feminist activism. And that is really a lot of your life to be living. Um, so I do, of course, my emotions and my heart are as engaged and involved as my head and my physical sense, my physical sense of myself and being in the world. That happens, this challenge, in the local, the everyday, the domestic, if you like, the, what we might just call the national arena. Um, but always trying to keep present in my mind the very vital and necessary connections between my local location, if I can put it that way, and the wider inter, trans, regional and national world. But then I remind myself, I come back to my point, there is, I remind myself of the Irish riddle, which is, question, where is the centre of the world? Answer, here. Mm -hmm. So even, especially when I am now there rather than here, or when the here has become there, or the there has become here, and I'm not in Ireland at home, but in Pakistan and away, very far away, I want to be able to be open to the challenges of that dislocation. So while I need to locate myself and have you know what my location is, so you can have a critical debate and discussion with me, at the same time, I want my dislocation in the present moment to be part of our conversation. Because of course, that's the kind of challenge and facing up to that kind of dislocation that helps me, I hope, to understand women's realities, the hopes, our dreams, our struggles, our achievements from a new angle of vision. And that when I relocate back there, which will become my here, however temporary my dislocation, I hope, and I think I know, that some of that new angle of vision will remain and will be reshaping how I see my part of the world and the rest of the world from there. It's no less a challenge to, a personal challenge, to confront the reality that I speak about, both here and there, and the reality that I speak from a position of privilege. And I'm very, very conscious of this marked by hegemonies, which, it's true, I set out to contest in my political life through my activism and through education. But those hegemonies have also given me a certain, albeit I think too limited, power and authority, if you like, and status. And that I'm speaking to you now about the fact that I am, and probably very clearly, um, I'm obviously white, I'm also middle class, and I think that's probably quite clear, and I'm very well educated, and I'm European. The Irishness, which is, if you like, the history of my geography, does, I think, inflect that hegemonic position, or that set of hegemonic positions, in an interesting and somewhat atypically uh, European way. It's a privilege, that hegemonic, hegemonic privilege that I possess, that's in me, which is also marked, however, by a history of colonialism, late industrialization, not really until halfway through the 20th century, relative poverty for much of the century, although that's not the case any longer, the political insignificance of Ireland in geopolitics, which is something that absolutely has to be grappled with, that you are a nothing falling off the edge of Europe 
and a lot of the time in waves of emigration trying desperately to swim over to the United States of America, land of the free and salvation and infinite donations and I know not what. <laughs> and of course it is that history of my geography has been at either end of the century in particular marked by the struggle for national independence. And that is a struggle which is very far from resolved, however close we seem to be to that point. And I want to share something with you, which I found out today, just about half past two, when I went to do my email, as Sarah will know. Oh, I should say that coincidentally, today is the Irish national holiday. It's our national feast day. So I wish you all a very happy St. Patrick's Day, from which you will note that our secular state is still heavily marked and inflected by Catholicism. And indeed, the separation of church and state has been one of the major challenges for feminism in Ireland in the second part of this century. And I do believe that at this stage, feminism is at last beginning to take the upper hand. But we can talk about that uh, a little later, if you like. But I learned today, very sadly, through an email from a friend who's from Belfast in the north of Ireland, that a woman I know slightly, a lawyer, who'd worked on civil rights cases in the north, was killed by a car bomb. And I simply want to salute Rosemary Nelson and her work. She was a woman who came from a Protestant, Unionist, therefore non-nationalist background, and I will explain these things in more detail in a little while. But she really devoted herself to working for an end to the discrimination which has come about as a result of the colonial history which has been imposed on Ireland and which continues in the north of Ireland. We are not yet, when we talk about the north of Ireland, talking about a post-colonial state. Colonialism continues, albeit in a modern form. The struggle for self-determination is one to which I am absolutely committed as a feminist. I think no feminist can not be committed to a struggle for self-determination for women. When we think of the kinds of issues globally that we've been involved in, it seems to me that this is very clear. My location, my history and my geography has meant that my feminism must interface with nationalist, anti-imperialist and anti-colonialist struggles, notwithstanding my very real and I think valid reservations about the gendering of such struggles and specifically the erasure of women once independence has been won. And this indeed is something that Rubina and I were talking about just last night. I was talking a moment ago, I hope I'm not going too fast, am I? Sorry, okay. I was talking a moment ago about um, the importance of interconnectedness in the context of feminist struggle and movements for women, women's liberation. I think I'm more conscious today in 1999 than ever before over the past 20 odd years. And they've often been, believe me, extremely odd years uh, indeed. <laughs> but I am very conscious of the need to develop our understanding of both the differences, and I mean differences containing inequalities. In fact, I think I mean inequalities even more than I mean anything else. Both the inequalities and the always fragile ground, the always fragile common ground between women in my own country and between uh, women in different countries and different regions of the world. But of course, thinking about and trying to be active around, activating that sense of the importance of interconnectedness is the other challenge, or one of the other challenges that I want to talk about. How do we do that? The world is not, after all, a village, and it's very dangerous to think and to say so. I don't subscribe to most postmodern theory. I will not accept the notion of the world as a village for the good and simple reason that the reality is that the vast majority of people in the world, and we came close to argument about this this morning when I raised the importance of the need for women to become involved in technology. And of course, Nikat quite 
correctly pointed out to me that 70% of women in this country don't have access to technology, probably something like 50% or more in Ireland. Almost nobody in Africa has access to uh, technology. It is a myth still at the end of the 1990s that everyone has access to technology. The world therefore remains an immense disconnected kind of space for infinitely more people than those for whom it seems to be a village. Now, and, and that not, doesn't matter how ubiquitous McDonald's has become. McDonald's is everywhere, computers are not, or access to computers. And of course, the question as to why there are McDonald'ses and not computers is the question of globalization and the free market. The growth of globalization basically, I mean, a free market economy, and perhaps particularly the spread and increase of so-called transnational corporations, which is a misnomer, if ever there was one, or a distorted word, if ever there was one. These are not transnational corporations, except in the sense that their power, their permission to exploit workers and to produce goods which have enormously negative reverberations on economies throughout the world. Those permissions, those rights are transnational, but the profit accumulation is not. The profit accumulation from transnational corporations goes back to the headquarters of transnational corporations, which believe me, I don't have to tell you, are not in Ireland any more than they are in Pakistan or anywhere else in South Asia on the whole. So, I think that we need to be thinking very carefully about uh, what this notion of the world as a village means and what the impact of globalization is. Uh, I'm very taken, I was thinking just, just the other day, in fact, I was on my way over here, about how we use that term, the free market economy. And the phrase that quite simply kept going through my head is a very simple one, free for whom? And again this morning, as we were talking in class, Nikat reminded us, of course, of the sexual trafficking of women, that women are being sold as sexual commodities or as sexualized commodities um, in this part of the world and certain other parts of the world. And what kind of free market economy is that? It is freeing up bodies for consumption, for consumerism and for uh, exploitation. So I think that these are obviously things that we need to be thinking about. The other point I just want to make very briefly, because it's not after all a lecture about globalization, is to think, is to make the point that the impact of change in one region, we also talk about the multiple uh, impact of change throughout the world, as if change is being identically experienced in terms of repercussions and so on throughout the world. Uh, but that's not so. Economic shifts in what I will rather loosely call the West have intense reverberations everywhere else. But the reverse is not true. The collapse of the so-called Asian tiger, and I should say that we now have a Celtic tiger also, the collapse of the so-called Asian tiger, the reverberations of that have not been experienced as severe inequalities and poverty and poverty, different forms of poverty in, broadly speaking, the Western world. So that I, I think we have to look very closely at these things and constantly remind ourselves that in this period, this era of globalization and the development of the free market uh, economy, women constitute the greatest and fastest growing share of the world's poor and have least access to the resources which can enable them to begin to combat the terrible effects of that poverty, which are, as we so well know, in millions of cases, fatal. We are not simply talking about a deprivation, which is a minor inconvenience, as it is and can be in many countries in the West, but we are talking about the fatal deprivation of the necessary resources for survival. For survival. Globalization and the free market then have not brought about significant reductions in the power differentials, the power disparities, which mark the world so acutely at the end of the second millennium. And they certainly haven't shifted 
the ruling locations in the world, the kinds of hegemonies that I was talking about in terms of my own identity at the beginning. The hegemonies of whiteness, of post-industrial capitalism, imperialism, in new and ever more mediatized forms, and therefore much more invidious and insidious and difficult to grasp hold of. How do you, we're talking about direct action today, how do you carry out a direct action against a television program which is being beamed all over this part of the world, for example. So there are ways in which that technology and its invasiveness and its pervasiveness are constantly, uh, is constantly reinforcing the gendered and other disparities and differentials uh, in the world. What I want to stress is that, and this I think is, is quite a difficult thing to say, even within this gathering of, of friends and co-workers and colleagues and co-activists, but I do want to say it nonetheless. I want to stress that for all our UN World Conferences on women over the past three decades, culminating in the slightly more tough-talking Beijing Conference and the publication, the agreement and publication of the Beijing Platform for Action. I do have some reservations about that, but nonetheless, I don't think that feminism is at all exempt from these hegemonies and may even be said to reinforce them. Now, please note, I'm saying I don't find this an easy thing to say, and I don't find it easy to say because everywhere in the world, feminisms and feminists are under attack. Some forms of attack, as indeed is the case in this country, are infinitely more severe than in, in others. But make no mistake, the counter assault on feminism is very clearly there. And while on one level, when you have a counter assault, you know you're making a difference. They've noticed. They want to stop you. You are in danger of becoming powerful and of being a threat. At the same time, women's livelihoods, women's survival, either physical in the worst instance, but also psychic and emotional and political, is at risk every single day. So I don't say what I'm going to say lightly. I don't think that feminism is exempt from the hegemonies. I do think it can be said in some ways to reinforce them. When we allow it, that is when we allow feminism or our understandings of the politics and the purpose of feminism to be dominated by, as Jackie Alexander and Chandra Mohanty put it, the histories and experiences of middle-class urban Euro-American women. And I stand here before you as one of those. I also will say to you that not so long ago I was writing a piece which was about those kinds of issues, a more detailed piece about those kinds of issues, and I called it Ex-Colonised Girls No More. And we always know far more if we have an experience of colonisation than do the colonisers, even when they think they have moved to some different place. I feel really quite strongly about this at the present time. Now, I also want to be really very, very clear indeed. This doesn't mean that I consider that feminism is or should be, should be dismissed as some kind of Western imperialist conspiracy, which is in itself a very, I think, profound and very acute and now increasingly widely practiced ploy, and in this part of the world in particular, a strategy to disable or to disempower feminists and the women's movement, as well as being deeply contemptuous and dismissive of the long traditions of feminist struggle in so many so-called third world countries since the 19th century, and of feminist engagement in many other social and political movements in this part of the world. I want to absolutely insist that feminism has its plurally specific histories, its presence in the plural, and its futures worldwide, and it also has many interconnections. What I worry about is the ways in which dominance can occur unthinkingly, and unthinking is as dangerous 
in some cases, even more dangerous than thinking and deliberate. Because feminism may have been, or may in some ways be, dominated on the international scene by Euro-American voices, theories, strategies, that's no reason to abandon it, even if that were possible, which I really fervently believe and certainly hope at the present time. It is rather all the more reason to challenge those hegemonies or dominant discourses, to test and to contest them for their usefulness and their effectiveness. Let, let us always, wherever we are, retain what is effective, appropriate and useful, but not what is not appropriate, effective and useful. Feminism, and I think it is a great challenge for us to remind ourselves of this all the time, is the property of no one culture or state, although it is embedded in specific states, even as it resists and subverts and contests them. And that contestation is vitally important. I'm keeping an eye on the time here because I do want to talk a bit about Northern Ireland. At the same time, it is incredibly important that gendered power relations and their specific constitution and expression in different geographical contexts should remain a major focus of our attention and our activism. Because quite simply, nowhere in the world is the state of women equal to that of men. Now mind you, achieving equality with men, equal rights, is in my view, you may disagree with me, an inadequate, and however paradoxical it may seem, possibly even inegalitarian objective. I think that striving for equality in the sense in which it is so readily used and transported around the world today is inadequate because the world, the value systems constructed by men and which they continue massively to govern and define and to police is not one to which I aspire. I do not aspire to equality in a world which is marked by injustice, violence, conflict, repression, accumulation of profit and greed and so on, individualism and so on and so forth. We could multiply these things. I think also that it may be, or I want to suggest to you, that this may also be inegalitarian. Because, just from my point of view, my objective as a feminist activist is, for, is far more revolutionary in the real sense of that word than the achievement of equality within an existing social or economic order. I don't want equality within the existing social systems and relations of ruling in the full and revolutionary sense. I accept that on a daily basis, we try very hard to build the better world by creating more equal situations for uh, women. But in the long term and in the vision, and it is so important for us to keep the vision, that's not what I am aiming for. I am not interested in reproducing existing stratified structures which leave the power differentials, material power and discursive power intact and which may even consolidate them by using the rhetoric of equality and the achievement of equality to persuade us that the reality has been realized and concretized. And that is something which I am deeply concerned about at the present time with the growing incorporation and institutionalization of feminism at government levels in individual nation states and across the world. This is not a time for us to incorporate with states. This is a time for us to maintain, even if we work in state organizations and institutions. This is a, a time to really maintain our independent view, our independent vision. And I'm so conscious of that. If I can just cite one or two examples from my own part of the world, from Europe, where equal pay legislation, which we've had in place since 19 the mid-1970s in the shape of a European directive, which is therefore law for all member states, it has completely failed to confront the gendered and racialized segregation of the labor market. So that in fact, 
some women do now have some more equality in terms of pay and so on. But the vast majority of women continue to work in low paid, low status employments without any chance of ever moving out of them. And I say to myself, yes, we did need that equality legislation, but it is so inadequate and it really is consolidating the class, the ethnic and other, uh, many other uh, inequalities. If I look at abortion and the struggle for abortion rights and other reproductive rights in Ireland and elsewhere uh, in Europe, I see that so often the struggle fails to embed the need for those rights, the right to abortion uh, in particular, I think, fails to embed that in a total holistic notion or demand or working towards a complete holistic health program for women which is free and accessible to all women and I'm very conscious of this in Ireland where you still need money to fly over or to take the boat over to England to obtain an abortion and money is something which women don't have for abortions not only because their pay is low but also because of the stigma attached to abortion they can't ask those who are nearest to them to give them the money for abortion. So we in fact condemn uh, women to great pain and great suffering in the meantime. The last example I mentioned very quickly uh, in the, uh, is again from the European Union. There has been massive, as there has been here, massive and extremely effective and important work in putting men's violence against women on the political agenda in European member states and even now at the level of the European Commission. But it's intolerable that refugee women, women members of many ethnic minorities in Europe, are excluded from the protections and redress offered, always reluctantly I have to say, but nonetheless now provided by the law to citizens of the European Union. So we have always to be looking at the ways in which some of our actions need always to be broadened out, need also to be placed and always to be placed in much larger uh, contexts and understandings. Um, there are, I think, um, a number of other things I want to say about that, but I do want to move on really to talk a little bit about uh, Northern Ireland. I perhaps should have finished that section by saying by just reformulating or, or, or resuming what I think is the great challenge there. And that is that naming the inequalities and fighting to overcome them in particular and also in solidarity transnationally is really the great challenge for us all in the 21st century and is going to be the responsibility and is going to be the objective that young women and young women such as are doing this women's studies course here in the Institute for Women's Studies in Lahore are going to have to assume and are going to have to really work to understand and are going to have to work possibly even harder than our generation, the next generation of women have had to do. I believe that that's really very important for if feminism is not life changing and life enhancing for all women then that's not what I call feminism. You may. I'm sure you don't. I don't. Um, I want to talk um, about Northern Ireland now because I, I assume you may have some interest in that, but also because creating the kind of solidarity I spoke about to give new and, and, and creating the kinds of structures that we need to give new shape and definition to the understanding and the politics of democracy and of citizenship and of freedom and of the meaning of nations is an enormous challenge for the island I live on, which continues to be divided by partition today. And it is a great challenge for feminists. I want to say that I, you won't know this, but I in fact speak about the north of Ireland with some trepidation because I'm not from the north of Ireland, although I have many contacts, both personal and political, social, even professional, with the North of Ireland. But I don't live there. I have not grown up 
through the war years in the north of Ireland. My life hasn't been marked by that war in material senses. My feelings have not been devastated to the same extent on countless occasions that the feelings, the hearts of my co-activists in the north of Ireland have been over very, very many years. And feminists in the north of Ireland, and particularly nationalist feminists, are often, and I think rightly, angry with feminists and women generally in the Republic of Ireland, in the South, for having been for so long, and in many ways still, indifferent to that conflict and indifferent to that war in any real and meaningful sense uh, of the term. In that, yes, we have a rhetoric of commitment to the unification of Ireland as a whole Ireland, but in practice, in practice, the South has been developing, has been enriching itself, has been becoming infinitely more prosperous, and really hasn't cared in the everyday about what is going on in the North of Ireland. And I think the North of Ireland has been a very beleaguered mini-state indeed, because of course Britain has never cared what happened in Ireland, North or South. Britain, if the truth be told, and I've no problem in telling these kinds of truth, truths, is now only too willing and ready to dump the North of Ireland, which is a constant drain on its exchequer. And this has caused many tensions, obviously, which you read about in the newspapers. The tensions that you read about, that you don't read about, are, of course, the tensions that existed, have existed for many years, between feminists in the South, feminists in the North, and also feminists in Britain. And it's only really within the past few years that some of us, North and South, so great has been the skepticism, the wariness, the anger of women in the North. Some of us have been trying to work cooperatively in a political sense. There are all kinds of projects, you know. You have your donors here. There are donors of plenty in the North of Ireland. And they have the same kinds of programs, I think, as, as you may have here. No political context, no political development, no political analysis. It's like sort of throwing money at something in order to preserve interests rather than disrupt the system. But there are now some projects which are seeking to work at making the kinds of solidarity that we really do need on the island of Ireland and um, across Europe and transnationally and so on. And we are also doing that with UK feminists, with British feminists. And you know, I say this working with British feminists on all kinds of things, and as the saying goes, some of my best friends, etc., etc. But you know, the problem of Ireland is always called the Irish question. And not so long ago, I was, was working with British feminists on an issue of a journal called Feminist Review, which they, which I think a number of us have pointed out to them, they had never focused on Ireland. I think there'd been about two articles, three, four articles on Ireland in a five-year period. And we simply said, why are you not focusing on Ireland? And they immediately said, oh yes, we love you to focus on Ireland. And I said, well, that's not exactly what we want you to do. We want you to focus on Ireland. We don't want to be doing the focusing for you. But of course, could they do it alone? No. So we did cooperate in the end, but we called the issue the Irish problem, the British question. Uh -huh. And I think <laughs> that shows you also, though, the serious point is that there are these very difficult tensions which persist and which we have to struggle with, obviously, in the everyday. Now, um, I want to maybe just give you very quickly a sort of potted history for those of you who don't know about Ireland and the North of Ireland, and I really will only take a few minutes to do this, but I hope it will be helpful. This is the part of this talk that has given me by far the most trouble. How do you summarize four centuries of history in five minutes. Well, I, I don't think you do. Just give an outline. When I talk about the struggle, I mean, in the national context, the struggle for independence from British rule. And that has very long roots. 
going way back to the 16th century and covering the whole island of Ireland, which is actually very small. And I think it's important to bear that in mind when you think of the partition of a really very small island indeed. In 1921, following a brief but quite bloody War of Independence in 1916, a treaty, same year as the Russian Revolution, by the way, a treaty was made which was a compromise. A deal was hammered out between the power brokers in Dublin and which split Irish Southern politics for many years, a split which has still not entirely disappeared from the political formations in Ireland. Uh, a deal was hammered out uh, between the power brokers in London and in Dublin, by which they agreed that the northern province of Ulster, or most of it, also called the Six Counties, if you see Ireland as this kind of shape, the northern province is that top right-hand corner. The northern province of Ulster, which had been settled by Methodists and Presbyterians and had remained Methodist and Presbyterian in very large numbers, therefore Protestant, that that would be handed over to the British. It would be partitioned off from the new state of era, the new Republic of Ireland, which was being formed. And of course, that mini-state, or non-state, it's very difficult to know what to call it, that province, as Unionist Protestants still call it, remained, and still remains, in effect under British rule, although it did have its own parliament until the war, until the conflict started in the 1970s. It had a relation to England, somewhat similar, but by no means identical, to that of Scotland and Wales. Those in favour of this union with Britain, loosely the Protestants or Unionists, were a majority in the newly created entity of Northern Ireland. And they wielded power from the um, putting in place of partition throughout their 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s, and so on, um, discriminating against Catholics in terms of education, in terms of culture, denial, no teaching of the Irish language or Irish history or Irish culture in the school, things that I'm sure you're all very familiar with. Uh, great discrimination in the labour market, discrimination in social welfare, in health provision, in housing, and so on and so forth. So that there, there is, there was and there is a Protestant working class, but the Catholic working class were infinitely poorer and infinitely more deprived and discriminated against than even the Protestant working class, who heaven knows are not wealthy. And uh, the, the, the major profit to be made, any profit that was made in the North of Ireland went straight into the hands of the Unionist middle class. It was a small Catholic professional class which is now uh, growing quite rapidly. Now, um, <coughs> Power was wielded, therefore, by the Unionists over the Catholic community, who were almost 100% nationalist. That is to say, against the union with Britain and in favour of reunification with Ireland. It can be quite confusing when you hear talk about unionists, because really, the nationalists in the North also want union, just happens to be with Ireland, while what we call the unions want unionists with Britain. Is that clear so far? Yes. And the struggle began, again, after a long period of relative abeyance. It began again in 1968. It was, of course, directly influenced by the civil rights movement, or inspired by the civil rights movement um, in the United States of America. It's that civil rights movement, which remained, broadly speaking, a non-violent civil rights movement for a couple of years, was rapidly rapidly translated into violent action or conflict in the early 1970s, the late 1960s, early 1970s. A conflict between militant unionists, known as loyalists, and nationalists, known as republicans, or what you would see perhaps referred to in newspapers and the media as the provisional IRA, which is the Irish Republican Army. A constant barrage 
of fighting between these two paramilitary groupings, both quite large, and obtaining arms from many different sources throughout the world. And I'm not going to go into the politics of that, but the politics of arms supply is, of course, one of the great scandals of the 20th century. And again, is another challenge that we have to face. And you, that this is not news to anybody in this garden. The barrage of fighting between the two paramilitaries was, of course, mediated from 1970 by the presence in the north of Ireland of the British Army. Equally violent, be it said, there can be... Oh, I don't have to shout anymore, thank you. Okay, because I could go on shouting into this thing. You'd all be deafened, I think. There is... There can be a perception that state armies are somehow, I don't think this thing, I don't think you have this perception here, that state armies are less violent, less fierce, less ferocious than paramilitary groupings. I don't think you have that perception here. There is a common perception propagated by states and governments that armies are legitimate because less violent somehow. Um, and that, <laughs> that paramilitaries are more violent. This, as we well know, is not so. But you can see that huge, massive conflagration, which has indeed caused many deaths and great pain and great suffering over the years. Fewer deaths, and far fewer deaths, it is true, than in many other parts of the world. But nonetheless, with huge reverberations in a country, an island, where the total population is only four and a half million. The consequences of war are, of course, also gendered. And while women constitute far fewer of those who died in war as a result of this conflict, women have borne the responsibility and the burden of picking up the pieces and of trying to continue some kind of normal, everyday, ordinary life. And this meant that while the women's movement in the South of Ireland in the Republic began 1970, I can name the day and the place and the time, began quite punctually in 1970. The emergence of a feminist movement in the North occurred much later, which is not to say that there were not feminists active in the North during the 1970s, but the emergence of a more conscious collective or set of groupings, of uh, feminist groupings, came much later in the 1980s because, of course, both in the everyday sense of women needing to prioritize the survival issues for themselves, particularly for their families, um, and because the national struggle has always been the number one item, the number one issue on the political agenda in the north of Ireland, and even up to a point, at least rhetorically, on the agenda, in number one item on the agenda in the South, although in the South it's very much more cosmetic than anything else. This doesn't mean that there isn't now a strong women's movement in the North, but it is different from that of the South. As, I'm saying, as I was saying, I haven't been affected by the war, but neither has anybody else in the South of Ireland. We haven't experienced the kinds of discriminations that Catholic nationalist women in particular have experienced, the interactive effect of those kinds of discriminations and injustices with their gender. Um, we haven't experienced that. Our feminism has grown up with the luxury of being able to be independent of issues around the national question, by and large, up to a point. I find that I have to say, very difficult to do. But if you look at the history, uh, the recent history of the women's movement in the South, you will see that. Whereas that's not the case for women in the North of Ireland. A major issue for women in the North of Ireland, which is one we have to take on in the South, is how do women from these different and virulently opposed communities learn not, not even to work with one another, how did they learn to talk to one another? How did they learn not to see each other as monstrous, as extraordinary, as dangerous, and in some curious way also even as evil? 
I don't know how, how many workshops, I lose my glass in my excitement, I don't know how many workshops I've been to over the years, which where Catholic women and Protestant women will be coming together to discuss maybe a particular issue, to discuss the political situation with great difficulty, great trepidation and great diffidence. And at the end of the day, women will be saying, I never knew that Protestants were like that. Or I never knew that you could talk to a Catholic. Isn't it extraordinary the way in which conditioning and ideology and those terrible antagonisms are constantly being reproduced? And isn't it our business as feminists to be breaking down those antagonisms? And isn't it an extraordinarily difficult thing to be doing? And I have the greatest admiration for the courage of the feminists I know in the North for taking, undertaking that extraordinary task and for keeping at it. In 1995, a slow transition to peace began in the North of Ireland, and leading to, I won't say culminating because the story is not over, but leading to a peace agreement almost a year ago at Easter uh, last year. Uh, somewhat ironically, the peace agreement was concluded on Good Friday, which is um, a Catholic, uh, Catholic feast. Catholic. It always seemed to me to be somewhat ironic anyway. This included the creation of some new all-Ireland bodies, uh, which I think are potentially extremely interesting. The point, though, is that that peace is not yet confirmed or consolidated. And you clearly have been reading newspapers that I have been reading over the last few days that may be even more up to date than me. But it is an extremely volatile and difficult process uh, indeed. And I think it is going to take a very long time indeed for healing to take place. There's much talk about reconciliation. Sometimes I think it's very empty and it doesn't have much political content. But there is no doubt that people's hearts and souls need to be healed if they are to be able to really overcome the hostilities and the antagonisms. And there will need to be great patience. But just a word about women in the peace process. If I have another few moments, Nikat, is that all right? A few years ago, I was at a conference in the North, which was really a conference mainly organized, organized by Republican nationalist women, but a conference at which some Protestant Unionist women were present. I should say that um, Protestant Unionist women seem to have been locked into even more traditionalist, familyist, familist um, uh, social structures than do nationalist women. It's a very, very paradoxical thing that in the North, the national struggle on the nationalist side, obviously, seems to have opened up more space for women. Generally, post-conflict situations do open up new spaces and opportunities for women whose lives have been affected in all kinds of ways during the conflict and have often had to be active in ways that they hadn't had to be active in before. But it is nonetheless really interesting to note that while I would certainly see Catholicism as continuing to be extremely repressive as an ideology for women, that Protestantism in the north of Ireland is even more resistant and even more oppressive and even more traditionist. But maybe that's not so surprising. The nationalists are, after all, about seeking, they're about seeking to create some new kind of space. The unionists are absolutely about preserving the status quo. So it is even more profoundly conservative, although there is, of course, a good and valid argument for seeing all nationalist struggles as in some sense conservative. But I think that there are differences in degree. So you are much, much, much less likely to find uh, the notion of a unionist feminist is almost, is virtually a contradiction in terms, whereas the nationalist feminist is not a contradiction in terms. And there is also a considerable layer of generally uh, quite privileged women who do not particularly affiliate either directly with republicanism or with unionism. Be that as it may, women really have been very significantly absent from the making of peace in Northern Ireland. And just before I came here, 
I was reading something about the peace process and I discovered in something which had been written by a man about it, he didn't talk about making peace. He talked, and I was so struck by this, he talked about waging peace. You wage war. You don't wage peace. You construct peace. Difficult peace by difficult peace. You do not wage it. And it seemed to me that if men indeed were going into a peace process with that kind of language in their heads, what kind of peace could we expect? And indeed, at this conference that I was at a few years ago, just after the ceasefires had been declared, a Republican woman said, and it's remained with me, it's never been written down, it's remained with me in my mind, if men make the peace, in five years' time, we'll have another war. <laughs> but this is so important, that it is so important for women to be involved in making peace. Because making peace is not just about smoothing down and soothing ego, egos and trying to pretend that there are no antagonisms and hostilities. It is and it must be about creating structures and systems, and I mean value systems, as well as political and economic and cultural systems, in which there can be openness, in which there can be real exchange, in which there can be real participation. I think when I listen to women in the north of Ireland, I am so struck, and I'm talking about feminists, by the kind of language they choose to use. The kind of feminism, the sort of activism that they're involved in, centers so much around issues of citizenship, to be full citizens, but not citizens in the sense in which citizenship has been defined in so-called democracies. There is a whole remaking of democracy, a reconceptualization and a reconstruction of democracy, which they talk about, often inspired by uh, feminists elsewhere, but it is absolutely part of the discourse in the north of Ireland that you talk about participatory citizenship and democracy. You talk about creating a culture of dialogue, absolutely a culture of dialogue and exchange. One, a democracy which must be open, not exclusive. Some women use the word inclusive, others talk about non-exclusive non-exclusivity or openness and I like that notion of openness. Inclusion is always a kind of holding within whereas that sense of it being open is very important and that must be accountable and transparent and which puts sexual politics in every sense of that phrase right at the centre of the new structures, the new systems and the new values which are to emerge. I do believe when I look at projects, when I look at political initiatives, when I look at the forms of activism that women in the North are involved in, I do feel hopeful and I hope that those women feel hopeful and I hope that there is support for them from <laughs> feminists in the South now. We have a deep shame to get over on that and I certainly uh, feel a very considerable responsibility. We are trying even now, to have public dialogues. And most recently, not very long before I came here, I had a dialogue with uh, an activist in, in public from the north of Ireland. And when we went to write up that dialogue for publication, um, I said to her, well, we have to call it the elephant in the sitting room. Because she said, in a moment of passion, and a moment of considerable anger, but you don't understand. We always skirt around this issue. We never really talk about what it has meant. We never really face it. We never really confront the differences and the inequalities between us. And there it is sitting there like a bloody great elephant in our living rooms. And I thought it was such an amazing way to say that and to see it. And I think that what women in the North and women in the South have to be about is pushing that elephant out of the way so that there can really be not freedom overnight, not instant liberation, there's no such thing, but some kind of 
space where we can work in some kind of solidarity and a belief in the possibility of solidarity to create real freedoms. And that will undoubtedly take a long time. But really, isn't the struggle worth it? Isn't it worth it? I want to, if you will give me another five minutes, not read a poem. Uh, some of the stuff I do is trying to think about political things, but writing about them in ways that are not so academic, or not so overtly political sometimes. And this is a piece that I've just been writing. It isn't even finished. It'll be very short. And it's about differences between generations. And I brought a few pieces with me, but I really want to read this for the students on the course, because we've been talking a lot about differences and about generational differences. So this is really for you. It's called My Mother, My Daughter and I, and I hope it will have some resonances for you in your different cultures here. On Sundays, I go to see my mother. We make extraordinary efforts to meet somewhere in the middle between all that divides us. Each week we confront, but almost never talk about, the differences between us. Differences of disposition and temperament, to be sure. Fewer, maybe, than we want or imagine. And clear as the day, except for their entirely unsimple inflection by the profound upheaval spanning the decades of our lives, hers and mine. Lives overlapping and intertwining for so many years, yet without continuity at their extremities. Born just after the first Western World War and Irish independence, she raised me to the very best of her means and abilities for a life like hers, as her mother had raised her. But that was not how it turned out. Born after the Second World War, child of the decades of Irish economic expansion and the growth of capitalism, I grew up into a far bigger world, full of possibilities my mother couldn't even dream of. My mother was born in Belfast, in the north of Ireland, but grew up and still lives in Dublin. She left school when she was 14 and did clerical work until she married, although her family was middle class. She had six children and worked full time at rearing us as hard as anyone I've ever known. For no pay and no independent social status. She looked after our father, made our clothes and our hot dinners. She grew vegetables, she bottled fruit and she managed to make ends meet. She taught us to say our prayers, to mind our manners, to do our homework and to turn out the lights more or less in that order. <laughs> when we grew up, and we grew up, not all of us all together, as expected or as hoped for, she went on caring for her children and then her grandchildren in all kinds of ways. Although she's always had numerous friends, her family and home are the center of her life, or so it seems to me. Now, this tells you nothing about who my mother really is about her very rarely indulged penchant for extravagance, about her intelligence, her humor, her energy, and her generosity. It tells you nothing of how she too must have struggled and changed over the years. The decisions, the choices, the dilemmas, the pains, the pleasures, and the hopes and disillusionments even that have marked her life are not here in the story I tell of her. It wouldn't be for me or anyone to tell you these very private things, even if I could do so. But indeed, I cannot. For so much remained hidden, buried and silent in the lives of women of my mother's generation and upbringing. I don't know clearly what being a woman has meant to her, how she experienced her sexuality, what she might have done differently if she had had half a chance. I went to university and have been in paid work since my early 20s. I married very briefly, chose to have one child by another man and discovered, and this is something we were talking about in class, my lesbian sexuality when I was in my mid 30s. My life has been so much more public than my mother's, teaching, writing, 
broadcasting, always politically involved. I've been able to make far more decisions about how I live. I no longer believe in most of what I was taught when I was a child. I don't fear God or the neighbours or believe in the unquestioned rightness of the state and the constitution. I believe in my right to take nothing for granted and to leave no stone unturned. I am afraid of the desperation of poverty and of war and of the degradation of this world we consume and abuse so thoughtly, thoughtlessly. I am deeply angry about continuing oppression and the denial of freedom. I do know for sure that I know very little about the shape of the future. Last Sunday, my mother and I talked about my daughter, her granddaughter, loving, admiring and acknowledging her difference and her distance from us both. The privileges I inherited have been passed on to her with interest accruing. For my generation of urban middle-class women in Ireland, in Europe, in the West, has gained a great deal. There is an irony in finding myself, of course, worrying about my daughter's future in the way my mother still worries about me. I've always wished my mother wouldn't worry about me. And of course, I know that my daughter Lydia feels just the same. I hope that I've raised her to be able to confront the challenges of her generation and to act creatively and fearlessly and generously in the world. But I think this may not be enough. And I'm not sure I can even dream far enough ahead to say precisely why. So I worry, because I am sometimes fearful about the future that has been made so fast and so carelessly without the participation of so many. I'm aware of how I drown out my mother's halting and much more timid voice with my fluent and noisy assertions. I'm aware also of the vulnerability of my own voice in the passage of time and the growing up of daughters. Generations are such provisional things, like centuries, like millennia. Thank you so much for your attention.